So uh, in the spirit of the new kind of science that I'm going to be discussing today, I'd like to begin with a few acknowledgments. Uh, uh, my good friends Rob Fitzsimmons and uh, Russ Lebo contributed to the design of the slides and to a lot of the ideas. And I'd like in particular to thank my co-founders, uh, Igor Bogdjevich in Belgrade, uh, Douglas Colton, who's our chairman and, and my own personal Rasputin, uh, and Dennis Corral, who's our genome scientist and uh, uh, with a lot of the scientific ideas that you'll see in this talk including uh, our entire engineering team based in Boston and Belgrade. Uh, I am merely, uh, they call me the pretty face, I'm not sure if it's accurate. Um, <laughs> these ideas are coming from an entire team of uh, very bright people. So every revolution starts with an ancien regime. Uh, in this case, in the new revolution for genomics, the ancien regime is pretty clear. It's a world in which cancer is defined not by its molecular drivers, but by the body part that it attaches to. It's a world in which the life sciences is still primarily observational. Uh, really up until 10 years ago, we still learned for the most part about biology in the same way that we learned about biology 100 years ago, 200 years ago. The tools have gotten better. We're certainly improving in the massive knowledge that we've built up over time, but nothing has really come along to revolutionize how we look at the underlying science. So this is the genomics revolution, and this is a graph that I'm assuming if you've read the New York Times or The Economist, you've seen before. Uh, that red line up top is Moore's Law in computing. Uh, computing power doubles roughly every 18 months. That blue line right there is genomics. It's Moore's Law in crack. Uh, this is an exponential growth curve uh, in which the speed at which we can read biological information as DNA data has doubled every five or six months. It doubles every five or six months uh, over the last, especially since 2006, when you really see it start to drop. So what does that mean? It means there are 28 companies tens of billions of dollars in public and private capital that are now giving us an unparalleled and constantly developing ability to look at a piece of DNA and read ACTG, GTCA, to read the underlying biological information as data. So what else does a revolution usually have? Uh, it has its bearded revolutionaries. Uh, we certainly have those. Uh, you'll actually be hearing uh, from, from that guy on the left, uh, George Church, uh, a little bit later today. Um, we have, uh, as most sciences do, the leading lights, the revolutionary vanguard of the scientific movement. These are the people who have managed billions of dollars in expenditures. Uh, these are the people uh, from whom the leading genomics discoveries has emerged. Uh, these are the, the drivers of this genomic revolution. Uh, and a revolution has to have, in the words of Eric Hobzabam, it's radiant tomorrows. Uh, this is a world in which food security is no longer an issue in which we can print organs, biological information, synthetic organisms uh, from information in the underlying DNA sequence. It's a world in which people are no longer prescribed drugs that are likely to make them sick. It's a world fundamentally about personalized medicine. Uh, I watched a TED talk uh, trying to get a feel for the, the format uh, in which the guy said, I can walk into CVS with my CVS card, my genome on it in 10 years, and they'll be able to say, no, you shouldn't be taking warfarin. That's going to make your blood pressure go haywire. That's the kind of radiant tomorrow that genomics is promising in personalized medicine. So my question is, what's the next stage of the revolution? How do we take this incredible fire of progress and pour gasoline on it? Um, my argument is that in the genomics revolution, it is time for the peasants to be in sharpening their pikes. And in this case, we are the peasants. So I'm going to take an idea that actually comes from Sean Parker of uh, Facebook and social network fame uh, in a talk he did uh, and make an interesting connection. This is Metcalfe's law, which uh, he popularized in his talk, uh, for telecommunications. If you've got one telephone or, or two telephones, then, well, we can make a connection. I can make a phone call to that other person, and there's some value in that network. When we have five telephones or fax machines in the system, when we've got five nodes in the network, all of a sudden we can make uh, five squared connections, or on the order of five squared. And if we have a whole bunch of telephones in this network, we can really begin to start making lots of connections, and the entire network grows in value. And so my argument uh, is that genomics functions a lot like this, uh, that genomics is about connections. It's not about the amount of data that you have, or if you think about it like an image, it's not about the resolution at which we're looking at a genome. It's about how many comparisons you can make between the underlying data sets. And so um, with the explicit intent of embarrassing my co-founder, uh, I'm going to propose Corral's law, that the value of every genome increases on the order of n squared as each new peasant joins the revolution meaning that with every new data set that we add to the public stock of knowledge in genomics, we can make more connections, more comparisons. 
Uh, the more that we add phenome data, so what do you look like, not just what does your DNA look like, uh, the more we add different kinds of data from each individual, the more we're going to learn about the system. And the interesting thing is that in genomics, it's not just the network becomes more valuable as we add new data sets, it's that every constituent data set in that network becomes more informative. So I'm going to be sequencing my own genome fairly soon, and with every one of your genomes that is sequenced and added to the stock of knowledge, I'm going to learn more about myself. So why is, what are the obstacles to uh, the peasants taking up arms? The first one is fear, uh, and this is an important one. Um, what happens when the insurance companies become, in our revolutionary metaphor, uh, Robespierre? Uh, when an insurance company can look at my data and say, I'm not going to insure you. Well, it turns out there's legislation in the U.S. against that, uh, fairly good and comprehensive legislation in Massachusetts in particular. Uh, but there's still some, I think, reasonable fear. What happens if somebody decides that a piece of my genome is interesting and wants to patent or commercialize it? I don't face that problem. I'm short, round, and redheaded. But there are a lot of pretty people in this audience. <laughs> they may want to commercialize you sometime. So the key salve for this is trust. Uh, and here I'd like to, to point to a couple of, of interesting cases. Um, in the United Kingdom, where the National Health Service uh, has earned the trust of the people, certainly on this front, no matter what's wrong with you, they will treat you. There's been a lot greater willingness to share patient data and to share genomic data uh, with pharma companies for drug development, for, uh, with doctors for developing new therapies, uh, for looking at how prescription medicine should be applied. Uh, and so in systems where you have this kind of accretion of trust over time, uh, we're certainly seeing the advent of people's willingness to share this data. In the United States, legislation is the first step, making sure people understand it and making sure that people are willing to share their data once they do understand that legislation is the next. And here's what it's empowering. It's empowering more networks, and this is where science is changing. I'd like to flip over here and talk about the, sort of the surface area for revolutionary change. Think of a sugar cube. It doesn't dissolve very quickly, but if you pour a packet of sugar into tea, I know you're not supposed to, but go with the metaphor. Um, if you pour sugar in, it will dissolve more quickly when there's more surface area, and it's the same sort of thing with revolutionary change. So on one axis here, we have the stakes of the genomics revolution, which are pretty high. And here we have the number of peasants with pikes. Let's think about the, uh, you know, another revolution that's happening today, um, social media. I'll, I'll pick on Facebook here. Um, nobody else is. So with social media, uh, you know, the stakes may not be very high. You know, we're building trust and we're building connections and all of that. Um, but the stakes aren't very high, but there are lots of people doing it. And so there's definitely a lot of surface area for change there. Today's biology, there aren't many people contributing data. And if you want to be a biologist, if you want to do the life sciences, it's still a pretty rarefied world. But what's happening with this increase in participation as genomics moves from a technological revolution to a social revolution, we're seeing a real increase in the surface area for the problem. And so in the one minute that I have left, I want to focus on a number, 99.9%. .9%. I am 99.9% .9 similar to this guy, or at least that's the claim that I'm making. Uh, so that's my co-founder right there and his brother. They're actually a little more than 99% similar. You can see that. Um, and this is a kid named Bertrand uh, who suffers from a genetic disease. Somewhere in that 0.1% uh, is the genetic mutation uh, that is causing his diseases. They don't know it yet, but my co-founder's data is what's going to make it possible for us to understand it. Um, that's my mom and my two sisters. They're watching on the webcast and weren't warned about this, so hi, mom. Um, <laughs> you know, if one day my mother gets cancer, one of my sisters gets cancer, uh, the way that we're going to understand how it works is if one of you contributes your genome, or all of you contribute your genomes. Um, one of my favorite open source movements is the uh, Ubuntu Linux operating system. It's fairly well known. Uh, and Ubuntu, loosely speaking, translates to I am what I am because of who we all are. And genomics takes a slightly different take on this in the sort of open source mentality. I know what I am because we know who we all are. And so genomics, the, the radiant tomorrow of genomics, is the era of personalized medicine. But I think that's the wrong way of looking at it. It's not the year of personalized medicine, what genomics can deliver to you with your genome on a CVS card. It's the era of participatory medicine. As all of us participate in this new revolution of data and understanding of each other, uh, we're going to learn more about all of us individually. Uh, and that's what empowers the era of personalized medicine. And so human thriving in the context of genomics and data science, uh, in the, the sciences more generally, uh, has to focus on this point, that before we can ever get to personalized medicine, before this revolution is delivered, uh, the promises that it has created, uh, it has to become a social revolution. That's the next step. That's how we pour gasoline on what's already happening. Thank you.